Hello everybody and welcome to the third of the live streamed writing workshops in support of the Bruntwood Prize. The Bruntwood Prize is run in, um, in, 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 in companionship with Bruntwood Property Development, uh, which offers a £40,000 prize or pool of prizes to playwrights. So we hope that this will inspire you to write a play and send it in and be a contender for that prize. We're here in Bruntwood's NEO, and I'm joined by playwrights Amy, Zodwa, Keisha, Naomi, Nick. Nick, sorry, and Kofi. And we're going to explore the idea of the epic and the intimate, and um, how that can sort of enhance your playwriting, because theatre does offer us the opportunity to create huge works of scale that explore profound subjects. And I thought we might start by um, thinking about what we mean by epic to start with. And I wondered if any of you had any ideas um, that you, you know, how would you define this idea of epic theater? I think any when ideas? Say, when you say epic, I think of things that have like moral weight. They ask like really probing questions, probably ethical questions. So you're thinking of the epic as big moral issues. Yeah. Big moral questions yeah. that the playwright um, invites the audience yeah. to explore That's or think about. Goes, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. big, big questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, other ideas? I was thinking more about the budget. <laughs> I think it's an epic, I was thinking about something yeah. that is on like a massive grand scale. Like Warhol or something? Yes, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that you won't see that often, you know what I mean? Something that is just like huge and really, really like over the top in a sense. So a play in a big space. Yeah. So a bit like the Olivier Theatre, the, the stage of the Olivier, which offers you the opportunity to create spectacle, um, and write for a number of characters, mm -hmm. yeah. so a large cast. Okay, any other ideas about the epic? I remember from like A level theatre studies, like wrecked theatres <laughs> and yeah. epic yeah. theatre. I think because it's related to like what Keisha's saying, it's like big subjects and big questions about society and stuff. Yeah, I think. Perhaps Brecht's idea was, you, you, we've all heard of this idea of alienation, yeah. and at the time he was writing, the focus was on naturalism, and he wanted to break through naturalism, didn't he? He described audiences as being asleep, and the idea was that epic theatre woke them up, so you, had, you didn't have um, scenes that, um, for instance, um, went on for a long time, you know, that you had episodic scenes, you had episodes, you had lots of scenes moving all over the place, that it wasn't linear in structure, that the plays might move backwards and forwards because the whole idea was that the audience was engaged, not just in the drama of the play, but politically, that the audience were making sense of the play. So the play's structure is a kind of language that the audience has to make meaning out of. And that meaning isn't just to do with the story being told, but the story behind it, the context, how the play impacted their own lives, etc. So that's, yeah, so that's Brechtian epic theatre. So any other ideas about the epic that anyone wants to throw into the mix? Is it the time, but, you know, the play that is allowed to kind of be two hours, three hours potentially. Yeah. Just this, that it's got the space to maybe be able to tell a big story. Yeah. So, um, so again, we're thinking about scale. Yeah. Um, so we're thinking, so what we've come up with at the moment is time, space, and theme. Big moral questions, big themes. I just, I like to start with, say, a dictionary definition of epic. Because that's always quite useful, isn't it? So there are two definitions. The first is a long poem, typically one derived from ancient oral tradition, narrating the deeds and adventures 
of heroic or legendary figures or the past history of a nation. So that's what you're going to create today. <laughs> um, and then the second um, definition was quite sobering, actually, because it, it, it says an exceptionally long and arduous task <laughs> or activity. <laughs> so there we, have <laughs> there we have a goal or objective that we want to achieve or interrogate. And the second is the trap that we don't want to fall into. We don't want to bore the audience. Um, it was interesting that you all mentioned space, uh, or some of you mentioned space, because I'm wondering if you feel that you have the opportunity to write big plays, actually. Because when I started writing, you'd be, when you were commissioned, you'd be typically told that you had five... You, you, you know that the budget was five actors mm -hmm. and that you were writing for a small studio space yeah. mm -hmm. um, is that the case for the rest of you 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 know but not not for you Kofi are you is that do you, is I mean, that I, what I you mean, are? for me I just write I kind of just write um, however so if I have a play with 15 people I write probably 15 if I play for two I'll just write for two I think that if you I don't know if you think that you can only write for a certain amount of people or for a certain space, you limit what you can create yourself. Do you then write um, with the idea that your actors will be doubling? Yeah. And that then becomes part of the play itself, the way that the story is told, that characters, that the audience, you, you have this sense that the audience are going to read the playing of one character into another, that there'll be echoes um, so, it's, for example, when an actor is playing one character and then switches to another, yeah. there'll be some kind of echo going on, some point being made about either the similarity or difference of that character, or some comment being made on subjectivity, the nature of human yeah. experience. Um, I wrote a play called Mules. Uh, I wrote it for Clean Break Theatre Company. and. Typically, for Clean Break Theatre Company, you're only allowed three actors, so three female performers. But the play I wrote had a number of characters, several characters, I can't even remember how many, maybe about 15, 20, something like that, and played by just these three actors. So it's interesting because that's quite an epic play in many ways. And it was written to tour prisons um, you know, which don't have many spaces. If you tour, if you play um, in a prison, you're going to be performing in a, a gym or something. But the play was epic in a way in its scope because it travelled across um, in, in time and space. So it, we travel from Jamaica to London, I think America as well. And within England, we travel north to south, um, so, the possibilities are limitless, really. Um, have you seen any plays that you would describe as epic plays recently? I saw Amelia. Amelia. And that really struck me. I think as, well, the big cast really struck me, and it did make me think about how I've stopped, like I stopped myself writing bit, for lots of characters because at the back of my head I'm thinking, oh, well, maybe I'd only get so many actors or could I self-produce it? And there was something about seeing, I know that was a commission, but there was just something really wonderful about seeing that kind of large that number of and that actors. And, and all female as yeah. well, were not it? And you just think, gosh, yeah, I've not really seen that. Yeah. Any other plays that you've seen recently or in the past that you would describe as epic? I did see one a few weeks ago at home, and it's just one guy, but he played like himself. Dad played by like his auntie, his uncle, and it was, he must have played about 50 yeah. characters. But it was a way that his body changed. Like when he was playing his younger self, he was doing like Michael Jackson pressure. He'd hunch his shoulders and he would like walk up like that. And then when he played his dad, he was like really big man, and like tattoos on his hands. But it was just the way he changed his body and his shape and stuff like that. I just found it really interesting. What was that play? Uh, Can Spark you remember? Plug. What was it called? Spark Plug. Mm, sounds really interesting. I've written down a few, just a, a few plays that I think are epic. Um, 
Road by Jim Cartwright. Has anyone seen that? Uh, and it all takes place in a street. Um, and it's an, in its original production, it was done as a promenade or what uh, immersive theatre, I suppose, with the audience kind of getting involved in the action of the play. Blasted by Sarah Kane, all set in one space, but with a resonance far beyond that space. Um, Misty by Arinzi Kenny. Did anyone see that? A one-man show, really, but a sort of epic journey into the mind of that character, a writer who has writer's block, and in order to overcome the writer's block, shows us the encounters or challenges that he faces each day. Um, the Writer by Ella Hickson, uh, which was at the Almeida Theatre quite recently. And that deals with really big themes about gender and theatre. And it's quite revolutionary in many ways in that it's quite a rebellious piece of work. You know, it's confronting um, patriarchal ideas of what a play is and breaks them all down completely deconstructs them and is its own thing. It's quite a wild play, so that might be another way in which we might think of the epic, in fact. An Adventure by Vinay Patel, which is a family, which you could call a family drama, but which um, spans decades and countries and is about migration and um, what people, how people become or, or change in response to the countries they inhabit and the legacy of that because even though the playwright isn't mentioned in the play in the way that the Rinzi Kenny interpolates himself into his um, script the playwright is somehow present in that play because it's a sort of memory play but it's a memory the playwright can't have actually it's a memory they construct from family um, myths, maybe, St or family stories. Ear for Eye by Debbie Tucker Green. Yeah. Now that's an, an amazing epic play, uh, which has three acts, um, each, of us with, each of which takes us into different territory. Um, the climax being a kind of um, exposition, if you like, of codes that were created hundreds of years ago, but which still have a legacy today. So the first two acts show us the ways in which those codes still affect the way that people live today. In fact, even though they know these codes no longer exist, they're sort of ghost codes that affect all of us. Um, so, so, so that's um, an incredibly, you know, a, a very big play. Top Girls by Carol Churchill. In many ways, that, that play ends with a scene which has become legendary between two sisters. And Keisha, you mentioned this idea of dilemmas or issues, etc. And in that final scene, two sisters each representing different sides of an argument or different kinds of feminism, mm -hmm. one perhaps being a bourgeois feminist, individualistic, feminism being about achievement, female achievement at any cost, and the other a socialist feminist. So these two sisters and the whole idea of sisterhood actually is highlighted in that final scene. Um, but that's a really domestic um, or intimate scene between just two characters which has a huge impact especially given that the first act of that play is as you all know a sort of last supper scene <laughs> between various women who have been retrieved from history um, at the time that that was that the play was written those women were perhaps hidden from history. Those women weren't the subject of history books. So they're, they're retrieved, they're uncovered, if you like, and tell, they speak, they tell their stories. 
to a woman um, from the, in the present. And those stories are relevant to her because they are about the ways in which women really broke free of, their, of the constraints placed upon them by a patriarchal society. So that's a huge, huge theme. And also in that um, play, the epic as experimental, you know, experimenting, pushing the boundaries of space and time that in order to explore these ideas, the theatre can, you can do anything in the theatre, you know, you, you, you can free yourself. Um, and I've got a couple more, Lions and Tigers by Tanika Gupta, which is a historical play which fits this definition of the epic that I read you. Um, legendary figures or the past history of a nation, so that play really fits that idea and that again is a personal story um, based on the letters that um, Tanika Gupta has in her possession written by her uncle who was a revolutionary. So perhaps you'll explore some of these plays or look at them or think about other examples of plays that you think of as epic. Um, I was thinking that what we might do is, although we're, started, we're, we're thinking about epic theatre, is that we might think about character. Aristotle also wrote about epic theatre and um, the idea that epic theatre was about heroes, characters who were important people. And of course there's been a move away from that to writing about the way that ordinary lives um, or ordinary people also can be the subject of huge big plays. You know, um, I grew up with this idea that the personal was political which was why I wrote, a, I wrote this play called Leave Taking, which is about um, an, uh, uh, an Afro-Caribbean immigrant, uh, someone who um, probably migrated to, this con to the UK in the late 50s, um, and someone who is invisible, really. They're not an important character. They're not, you know, they're, they're a cleaning lady but they are the center of the play. And as soon as you put someone on stage, it's as though the, the, the stage becomes a sort of magnifying glass, that that character becomes important. And that in itself, I think, is quite political. So I thought we would start with a character exercise, and then we'd move to, so we'll start small and then move beyond that. So we're going to have our first writing exercise and what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you some questions about character and before we do it I'm just going to tell you some rules. This exercise is from a book called Playwriting uh, by, oh no it's called Script Writing, sorry, A Practical Guide by Noel Gregg. And it has some really wonderful exercises in it. And they're the sorts of exercises that um, somehow um, simulate what writers actually do, the way that writers actually work, playwrights in any case, because often when I pick up a manual, I'll see exercises in there that you say, well, no, writers don't do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's no use to me whatsoever. But that book actually, you know, a lot of the exercises are very useful in like starting really a play. Dense. Sorry? Sometimes like they're really dense. Yeah. You don't even understand what it's saying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you just, you know, you want, it, 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 but this, it, it, it does what it says on the tin. It's a yeah. practical guide. Um, he lays out some rules for undertaking this exercise. And I'll tell you them before we get down and do the exercise. So you're going to create a fictional character from scratch. 
And so what you need to do is really relax and not think about this, but just let whatever comes into your mind come. The only time this exercise doesn't really work for people, I've, I've done this exercise a million times, and it's always really interesting. The only time it doesn't work is when people think too hard. <laughs> when people try to perform rather than to just let whatever happens happen, which always has to be an aspect of writing. You know, we do all our, all our research, etc., and we think really hard, but then at some point you just got to improvise on the page, and that's really important because it's important to be surprised by what comes up, you know, that you can work with. So his rules are go for someone very different from yourself. Now, I'd just like to add there that different from yourself doesn't necessarily mean that if you're male, you write female. If you're female, you write male. It doesn't mean that. Though often when I do this exercise with people, that's how they interpret it. They think it means I'm young, so I, I'll write someone old. I don't think it quite means that. I think all it means simply is don't write about yourself. Which, again, you know, I mean, we, we only have ourselves to draw on, but that's what it means. Avoid basing the character on any real person. And that includes you, I guess, doesn't it? Um, follow the instructions and don't think too hard. And you know absolutely nothing about this person. So we'll take a break to do this exercise now. So how did you find the exercise? Did, did you all come up with a character? Yeah. Were you surprised by what you came up with? Um, in what way? You don't have to go through the whole list or anything. Um, but what, what, what did you find surprising about that exercise or the character? I've never Kofi? written a character like this before. You've never? Written a character like this. Really? But it's an interesting character, yeah. one that you'd like to pursue. Can you just tell us a tiny bit about them? You don't have to go through the whole list. Uh, what is it you want to know? What anything do you see? Um, who, their name, age? So his name is Ben, he's 24, and he's a painter. He works in IT. He works in IT? Yeah. When you say painter, he's a visual artist? Yeah. Okay. What's his secret? Uh, that his best friend's girlfriend is cheating on his best friend in the US. Oh, that's a juicy secret, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Was anyone else surprised by what they came up with? Want to tell us a little bit about their character? I was surprised by just how random and a bit ridiculous life went. Yeah. I didn't try and control it at all, so the things that I've come up with, I'm not, I don't know if I could do anything with those. Really? Yeah. <laughs> 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 it was definitely a starting point, though. Yeah. But yeah. Is that you, part of your style uh, in uh, at all or not? Is that different to how you work as a writer? Is that part of your process? No, that's no. very different to how I could work. But I can see that how some of my style has sort of influenced some of the answers, and that actually I have to rein some of it, some of it in a bit, maybe. Really? I I think, I don't know, my character's secret is that she killed her parents. Oh! And then wow. she came out. And I didn't, she's a librarian and it's in a character. <laughs> oh, wonderful! <laughs> oh, that sounds I amazing. I don't know where that would go, but yeah. It was, okay, well, we'll you know, see where it will go. Okay, because we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, Zodwa, did you want to say something? I, I think it's the same thing, that I think there's things that I, I go to and I get uh, wedded into the thing that I've thought first. And I was like, no. I need to change location and just change it fast. So I went from being in the north of England to now being in Brooklyn, which I know nothing about, <laughs> but we will make something of it. Okay. Um, and I think just needed to go, just do the opposite of what you usually do and play with that. That's what's happening right now. Did you want to say something, Keisha? Um, I don't know. I don't like judging my characters, but I feel like this person I'm creating, I was just a bit like, why? Who are you? Um, 
Yeah, and I just feel a bit like I, d I have no control of this character. I don't know where, what I would access to write, to flesh them out. Okay. Um, and I was like, do I even find this character interesting? But I suppose, again, I'm like, I could make any character interesting. Do you know what I mean? You just got to yeah. find the right situation or whatever. But it almost felt a bit teenagery to me. When the stuff that came out, I was like, oh, really? Okay. How old are they? They're 26. Okay. Um, but yeah, she's American and she's at like a school reunion and it's just a bit like, what? Mine's like a teenager. Yeah. American. Yeah, I was just a bit like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not where I'm, if I, yeah, yeah. If I yeah, chose, it's just not where I would go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's good to have a starting point though, because you can always revise this. There might be something in there, some nugget that you want to develop, but you don't have to take absolutely everything that comes yeah. um, through improvisation. Really it just yeah. felt, for some reason in my head, I was like, this feels cliche. This person feels cliche to me, and I don't know why. But um, that that can happen, can't it, while mm -hmm. you're writing, and that's part of the challenge of writing. Do you find that anyway while you're writing that that can sometimes um, occur during the writing process. Either, I mean, it can be politically mm. that you write something that you think is actually politically off, or typically you might create a female character uh, who might be passive or some, you know, and where you are wanting to write female characters who have agency and yeah. power, but that's fine because you can always revise it mm -hmm. and it's 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 always so sh quite shocking in many ways how conditioned we are sometimes so you might find yourself right coming up with things that yeah. you actually don't want to write but the joy of writing is that you can you can revise yeah and shape it and you confront yourself on the page and you question yourself you you challenge yourself and you move beyond mm -hmm. that sort of I mean I'm going moving away from what you started talking about but you move a, move beyond the conditioning almost mm -hmm. and so that's quite powerful and a political act isn't it really yeah. that we can make choices that go beyond you know that kind of um, you know what we're expected to produce or what yeah. we're influenced by in I think the world that's why I feel bad judging her because I'm like she can be anyone can be three-dimensional and I can make her interesting yeah but at this point in time for some reason I'm just a bit kind of like don't like her. okay <laughs> <laughs> but you uh, the, the, we're, we're, we're sort of um, but that's an, another topic isn't it yeah. you do you have to like your characters no no but she's not done anything that's unlike not yet <laughs> <laughs> Um, that, that's one of the um, very dangerous things about writing mm -hmm. in many ways that playwrights do like all their characters mm -hmm. even characters who mm -hmm. do the most ghastly things oh, yeah. actually we, we develop a sort of empathy in order to be able to write them but let, let's continue anyone else want to comment Naomi? Um, I think there probably is something quite powerful about the teenage years and our subconsciousses because my character is a teenager mm -hmm. as well um, and yeah, they're quite superficial on surface level um, at the moment. And I think the only interesting thing about them is that they are a young Muslim female, but their secrets have been secretly going to a Christian church with a friend from Ooh. college. Mm -hmm. That's um, really interesting. Yeah. That's quite big, isn't it? Meaty. It, it could be. So someone whose um, faith is challenged, but for whom faith yeah. is important. Yes. Yeah. And why... why why shouldn't young people be the central characters in a play? You know, why should... You, do you see what I mean? Um, we, we were talking about what, like, the epic play traditionally being focused on important characters. Mm -hmm. And often, young people... When, when you have a young person at the, as the main character of a play, that play is a youth theatre play. But... You know, a young person once said to me, well, why can't you have a young person at the centre of a play in, on a main stage, in a play that's meant for, written for adults, actually, and not just for young people? And that's something to think about, isn't it, in many yeah. ways? So that, again, is a challenge um, 
challenge this, challenging this idea of what's a big play, who, who is the subject of a big play, and who isn't, who isn't allowed to be the subject of a big play. And yeah, Nick? Yeah, I ended up with an older character, because um, I took this disorder man in a retirement flat, and then I felt like that was shaping everything, because like, I felt like I could just see this space. Maybe because my granddad had been one of those where I did feel like I kept drawing on that space, but it was about someone who's on their own and is secretly in love with a woman that works there. So it's kind of about loneliness, Ooh, really, and him trying lovely. to think of how to speak to her when he yeah. sort of goes in and out of the building and things like mm. that. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. Mm. Uh, starting point. I'd like to see that. But talking about space, um, we were talking earlier about. Um, big plays, if you like, let's call them big rather than epic, um, being determined by the spaces that we're allowed to write for. And um, so I wanted to think about that a little bit more. The writer Stephen Jeffries used to, I don't know if you come across his idea of open and closed space. So you have, who else has come across this? Um, anyone else? So, um, Stephen Jeffries conceived of the rela uh, structure being predicated on the relationship between space and time. And so, both space and time could either be open or closed. So, a play that's written with an open time structure, if you like, is one that, is, that ranges across time. So it might be, it might take place, um, it might actually take place over the course of a day, because you might have scenes that take place in the morning, late at night, midday, so it, it ranges across time. It might take several years or a year. That's open time. And closed time is a play that takes place in real time. So if the play is of half an hour duration, that's how long the action of the play takes. And everything that can happen within half an hour happens in your play. So, um, and similarly, open space is a play that takes place in a number of locations. You can sort of move around, um, you can go anywhere, you can go to the moon, you can, um, go outside, you can stay inside, uh, or to several rooms in a house, and closed space is a play that takes place in one central location and doesn't mean, move. And the combinations, the ways in which you sort of define or, or construct a relationship between those two things will determine how big or small your play is. Well, not strictly speaking. But for example, a play that's written with close space, close time, takes place in one space in real time. Um, many plays are written open space, and the epic play, open space, open time. So a number of locations, um, um, and it can move back and forth in time. Um, you can have flashbacks, you can... Um, you know, you can jump years ahead. It can span a hundred years, or, as I mentioned before, a day, which is kind of a day is an interesting. You know, 24 hours is an interesting idea. You know, the Aristotelian idea that your play has to take place over the course of a day, have everything wrapped up within that time. Um, so I was thinking about space and how that changes your play. Um, I'd started thinking about this last year when an old play of mine was revived, Leave Taking. I mentioned it earlier. And this play is set in two houses, if you like. One, the house of this cleaning woman. Two living rooms. And when it was revived at the bush, they did away with the room. Usually this play is um, pre performed in a very naturalistic space. So you've got certain kind of carpet, wallpaper, pictures on the wall, armchairs, etc. And at the bush they completely did away with that. And so you just had this space um, with a suggestion of 
different rooms, you know, because the levels of the floor would change. Some, some parts of the floor were a bit higher than others, but sort of marking out almost like the foundations of a home. And so when the audience was watching it, they had to imagine the walls of the house, and they did. So someone described it as a sort of ghost house, and that kept that configuration kept changing. And what it did was it revealed aspects of the play that hadn't come out before. So when people had at first seen this as this sort of small domestic play, mm -hmm. suddenly burst open, even though there were only five characters, it took on a sort of epic poetic quality. And that was fascinating to me. Um, the designer said that her and the director had talked beforehand and they wanted to stretch the play and that's exactly what they did. They brought out things I'd never seen uh, come out in that play before. They were always in there, but they hadn't quite <coughs> come through in the way that they did. So I thought we would think of space a little bit and think of... Um, space as a, a character. I recently, just a few days ago, I saw a piece called Rooms by Ender Walsh and it was on the stage. Has <coughs> anyone seen this or heard of it? And there were five huge cubes really and the audience was split up and we were led into different rooms and there were no performers, all we heard were recordings of monologues. So the characters were like ghosts and we were allowed to go into each room. One was, uh, there were a couple of bedrooms, a bathroom, a kitchen and an office space that had been burned. It was, it was, it smelt like, it, you know, you were going into a place that had recently been on fire, that had been kind of saved, if you like, just about, a ruined room. And then you were played these monologues. So it was a little bit as though the rooms were speaking to you, or the ghosts that once inhabited those rooms were speaking to you. But also we were allowed to kind of search the rooms and look for clues about the stories that had taken place in them. Um, for example, in the bathroom, it was smashed and there was a hammer on the floor. So in some ways, we were creating that story as much as the, um, the narrators were, the monologues um, themselves. And I'm also reminded of a play I saw many, many years ago um, called Time in the Room by Botto Strauss. And that's set in a, a one room and then very strange things start happening in that room. Um, lots of characters unrelated to each other start coming into the room. Some of them are um, characters people have spotted in the street whose stories they, they've guessed at and they suddenly enter the room and those stories start playing out. Um, and then at one point the room itself starts to speak which I loved. Mm -hmm. The wall sort of suddenly started to tell you its history and characters from different um, eras entered the room as well. Um, a bit like um, the, that play, I don't know if any of you saw it, The Hour That We Knew Nothing yeah. of Ourselves, which um, I saw at the National Theatre some years ago and it's set in a town square kind of generic town square, and it's a play without, word, without words. There's no um, spoken dialogue. It's completely silent. And all it is is a number of characters cross the stage, and then this becomes increasingly bizarre. You, you start as an audience to create stories for the characters as they walk across the stage. It's a bit like sitting in a busy railway station and watching people watching um, but then characters start to appear from opera um, from the past uh, like a group of monks walk across the stage 
And it's bizarre. So the history of the town centre itself is somehow embodied in, or, 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 or yeah, embodied and made real in the theatre space. Um, very interesting. So what I thought we would do for the next exercise is just think a little bit about space. Um, well, before we do that, I wanted to ask you if when you're writing plays, there are two, th two questions really. Um, does the theatre, when you're commissioned, do you know what space you're commissioned for? And do you write a play for that space? Does that somehow influence the play you're writing? Um, and do you think about the design at all while you're writing? I know we're not designers, but I just wondered if you have a sense of what your play might look like. Um, or do you, do you completely leave that to a designer? Do you have a sense of how it, it, aesthetic, aesthetically it might look? Yeah. You do? Like visually, yeah. yeah, visually. Maybe also partly because I, I studied theatre. Yeah. All the different components. I know how they work. Yeah. Sometimes the trick is not to put everything in, like <laughs> write it directly <laughs> myself. Um, yeah. So I just kind of bring that down. But I think I genuinely do see, kind of scene by scene, how I want it to look and feel. Um, and then I do consider um, space. I do, yeah. Because I think I, I like um, responding to space. Because now I'm writing for a different space. Um, it was in the round. I've never done that. So mm. I have to kind of consider how do the characters behave mm -hmm. in that space and how the story is told. Is it possible to describe a bit how that influences your writing? Because you said how the characters behave. Um. I think in terms of when it was kind of um, end on, I think I always knew that the direction of kind of communication is that way or kind of on stage to the other characters. Whereas now I have to consider them constantly kind of in motion and motion kind of up mm. and kind of talking to the audience because the audience is kind of in this column. So now I have to kind of think about okay, what is it that they're doing and, and, and saying um, in that space now, um, but also it, it kind of opens up the, f the freedom to kind of play with space and time, and I think kind of having like these uh, multiple entrances and exits, I can just do kind of anything with it, which I find exciting now. So they can leave in one exit and it's kind of 2019 and kind of come back in like 1950. <laughs> and I think, oh, that's quite fun. That's wonderful. So actually you use language like free, yeah. open up, play, yeah. and that's what a big play, an epic play, can allow you to do, isn't it? Yeah, and I'm really. That I, I'm, do, I'm writing an epic scale. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's big. Mm -hmm. So, so it has to fill that space. It has to fill the space. Yeah, and I think um, even kind of the idea of the space in itself, but also kind of the subject matter, is epic. So having to kind of respond and kind of doing it uh, kind of a service to it as well. So I, I cannot. Maybe just kind of build it in my head, but like just kind of realizing kind of how important it feels, and when you can find a kind of click that it is epic, and you want them, you want the audience to kind of feel that kind of epic nature of the characters or in, and of the space, um, and I have to feel that somehow. So that's kind of what kind of all the writing does, and the rewriting and the redrafting is about kind of thinking about what is that end outcome and feel that I want them to take away. Um, it's interesting. There's something you said there that made me wonder if, you know, because one of the themes of this workshop was supposed to be um, intimacy mm. and the epic, the relationship between the two. And from what you were saying there, it made me think that actually you, the epic is created also through intimacy. Yeah. It, it's, it's like the power of um, silence in theatre, mm. isn't it? So yeah. you. You know, we, we, we usually think of theatre as being dialogue-driven, etc. But those moments of silence become really powerful, they do. don't they? And I think um, when you when it's an onslaught of epic, then you, that that loses its an, its effect. So then being able to kind of take them like on that emotional journey where we do kind of grow from like a silent moment and a single person to suddenly like twenty people in a space. That I think is is the beauty of kind of that live relationship between like, the performance and the, the performer and the audience. And it's also showing that huge events, yeah. which is what really the epic is dealing with, have an impact mm -hmm. on the, on people, on, day, yeah. on real people. And so the intimate scenes 
can explore that, can't they? The, the sort of um, influence of big events, world events, yeah. on a small domestic scale. I think that's like the, the challenge sometimes is just being able to look at the small thing and how that small thing represents like the bigger idea. So yeah. if, if the play in itself is like this kind of epic thing, everything cannot be epic. No. Then does it mean that every small bit cannot have an epic resonance? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Did you have something to say? Uh, Can you yeah, remember I mean, what I'm you wanted? The opposite view. When I'm writing, I just, I just write and there's something I will have to deal with consequences. <laughs> <laughs> the one I'm writing now is like, there'll be in a field, then there'll be in a park, then there'll be in a cat, then there'll be in a set. Like, I have a uh, the person who do that is going to be very, very difficult, but <laughs> just that's just the way I write. If I'm writing, I can't really. I think if I write like that, I might limit what I can do. Because if you tell me that I've got this stage here, then I'm like, that's not going to work, is it, if I do that? But that's how I envision that to be. So if I can just write it, then the person will just maybe have to deal with the consequences of what I'm doing. <laughs> Has that ever been a problem at all? Or, or you know, have you ever de 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 delivered even something that people have said, "Oh, that's going to be impossible," or, or have they always found a way? No, there's loads of stuff that people are like, "That's that's not feasible." And I'm like, but I still wrote it anyway, so because I wrote it because it was in my head. There's no point of writing something down and going, "Oh, that will never that will never be commissioned." So there's no point in writing it because one day someone might read it and go, "Actually, let's just try it and see what happens." So. I can never quite understand why people say it wouldn't work, even in a small space. Yeah, I agree. Do you find like, that odd? I am almost like you because I write, I try not to, I know that I can be very visual and if I have a certain thing in my head, I'm like, do you know what, I need to write this, I've got a strong like visual aesthetic. But I'm also really excited about leaving it open because I feel like a designer will see it as a challenge yeah. and I'm like, oh, how will someone interpret what I've written, how will they? encapsulate this and interpret this but it should never be like a pragmatic problem it just feels ridiculous for someone to say that's not feasible it's like we're dealing with theatre like it's all <laughs> imagined <laughs> it's all constructed and we're asking the audience to have a contract with us of pretense so to bring in words like feasible just feels <laughs> like yeah I've, I've, I, I've had the same experience myself and I've I've never really understood it because mm -hmm. I think you can create anything from nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we do have imaginations and I remember reading, uh, you know, some playwrights um, will just say, oh, there's a, an apple on stage to represent, you know, an orchard. Mm -hmm. And you can do that, yeah. can't you? Um, anyone else want to add anything to, uh, about the impact of space on their writing? I just wanted to add that when I'm thinking about space I try to think about the audience experience mm. that's usually what um, informs me um, yeah so as opposed to thinking specifically about how a space might look I'm more interested in like okay what environment am I trying to create what space am I trying what tone am I trying to set how do I want people to feel um, and how will that be manifested in terms of like, you know, the layout. So if I want people to feel very intimate or closely connected to this character, do they actually physically need to be close or how does it need to be, yeah. So that's usually something that I consider just like audience experience. And I don't know if again, similarly to Zod, but it's because I'm, I'm a producer as well and I'm like fear making and whatever else. So as much as I get very like invested in the story, at the end of the day I'm like, the story needs to be communicated through an experience. That's why it's being, that's why it's a play. It's not a book, it's not a novel. So it needs to have a different kind of, yeah. kind of uh, intention. There is an emotional investment yeah. or engagement. You want the audience to engage with it in some way. Um, could be that you want them to be angry with it or yeah. whatever, but yeah, <laughs> but you want some kind of reaction. We're going to do the next exercise, which is to do with space, um, and then we'll move on to a few other ideas. So we'll take a, a little writing break.
So you've been, you've just all written a paragraph describing a space inhabited by your character. Does anyone want to read theirs out? Okay, yeah. thank you, Nick. Uh, so my, my older gentleman, Don, is in the retirement flat. So I imagine him being in this very, this space that feels very temporary. Like he's not put photographs up, he's not put pictures up. There's this sense of non-permanence. Um, he's got like a chair, you know those chairs that are electric, people's back. So there's also a sense of him preparing for a slightly older version of himself. So there's something Ooh. quite sad, I think, mm. about that. Um, you know, just a table, tea chairs, newspaper, so it just doesn't feel a very personal space. He's not really made a, a mark on it, and I, maybe he doesn't know how to. Mm. Yeah. I think when you first talked about this idea, the thing that really um, intrigued me was, A, you said it was a love story, so that was unexpected and surprising, and so I'm in, I'm in, I'm, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> um, but it also struck me as um, a space where memory could unfold, a space where actually anything could happen even though it's supposedly this sort of retirement home and the fact that you've described a space that's almost like a blank space, you know, you can project anything onto it. So um, there's a lot of possibility there, I think, you know. Um, anyone else want to tell us about this? Yeah. Is that Zodva? Yeah. Um, my character is called Yellow. Oh, and she's nice. 16. Um, so she lives um, in a flat or an apartment uh, and has two bedrooms, uh, one for her parents and the other for her and her little brother, and he's deaf. Uh, and they divided up the rooms by the color of their rugs. And yellow's, of course, is yellow, and then Thomas's has trucks on it. <laughs> um, and she doesn't mind sharing a room with him because he's her best friend. Uh, their house is cozy, but they're happy in it. Um, her parents, Jazz and Derek, were childhood sweethearts, and what they built, they built on their own, and gratitude and blessings hangs in the kitchen as like a sign, um, and they have a small radio which is turned on every morning like a ritual. So do you see, do we see all the rooms? At the minute. Or do we just see the children's room and the hear the others? Have a sense of the see, others. We have a sense of the, that there's more to the house, but what I know for sure is that the family space is the kitchen, and then there's the, two, the bedroom. And I, I like the idea that the space, the, the children's space is further divided yeah. um, by the colour of the rugs. Um, and th that again gives us possibilities mm -hmm. for playfulness, um, which was a word you mentioned earlier, and for um, other stories or the imagination to be manifest in that room yeah. in some way. But I, uh, the idea, I'm intrigued by this idea of the child space and the adult space and the adult space being somehow off stage at the moment, mm -hmm. off, yeah. that we can hear it maybe, or yeah. that, 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 that there is a relationship between the two. Yeah. Already that starts to form, a story starts to form there, doesn't it? Or a conflict even between the yeah. two. There's definitely going to be like a, a private space, which is not really private, she's like a private section of her room. And then like there's the, the community space, which is like the kitchen. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> Anyone else? Did you, were you ready to? Uh, yeah, I've got one. So my character's called Ben. Uh, so he's in his small bedroom. He's got a picture frame, just, uh, just like a football t-shirt and an old t-shirt. Uh, half drunk bottle of whiskey. And he's got cameras in front of him. Uh, paint bottles, and he's got a sort of uh, other canvases that just stacks up on mm. each other in his small bedroom that he's already painted on. Yeah, I like the frames as well, because immediately you said frames. I I thought, they, do they have anything in them, or you know, uh, uh, or are they empty frames? Or uh, the one, the most important frame to him has the football T-shirt in. That's just an old T-shirt. That's what means the most to him. Okay. And, and can we, so can we see some of the paintings he's executed or yeah. do we imagine them? No, we can we see, see them. Yeah, we see so this is, um, did you say that was a bedroom or did you say it was bedroom, a studio? A small bedroom. A small bedroom. Yeah. How old is he again? 24. I envision him in like a shared house. Okay. Yeah. 
And this is a private space then? Yeah, this is just his. Where he creates his work. Hmm, that's intriguing. I wonder who else comes into that space. Um, and the way they impact on it. Um, yeah, and how the paintings, what, what is it he's trying to achieve? Is there a specific thing he's trying to do with the work, I wonder? Or I don't know. Yeah. You don't know <laughs> yet, no. But lots of, some questions coming up yeah. there, yeah. Naomi, did you want to read yours? Uh -huh. You don't have yeah. to, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, so, Khadija lives in a mid-terrace, three-bedroom house in Halifax. There's no garden, just a backyard, with a washing line hung across, and her brother's bike is leaning against the back fence. There's various cheap plastic plant pots containing brightly coloured flowers, and the back door leads into a long, narrow kitchen, and on the side is a pile of empty plastic takeaway containers, and on the back of the kitchen door there's a bag of bags. Um, you know, bag of bags. Yeah. Um, Everyone has that. It's a green rice cooker in the corner and it is on. Mm. Ooh, there's a lot of expectation there. Or we anticipate something about to happen. Something's being prepared for the arrival of someone or s some people, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> mm. Okay. Um, look, Keisha? Yeah. Um, so my character lives in America, in New Jersey, I've pictured her. So I'm picturing like a very big house um, with like a massive back garden, but she actually just lives in the basement. So um, yeah, the basement's been converted and that's her apartment. So it's got a kind of studio vibe to it, kind of open plan. Um, she's got a back door with a cat flap um, and she's got a side window to the back door which has got wind chimes and crystals going along the windowsill um, and the light comes through in the afternoon so she gets to see a glimpse of like sunset through the back uh, but otherwise it's quite dark. Um, she has a stack of magazines that are mainly hair magazines, hairdressing magazines but behind that, she's got books around like crystals and white magic and stuff like that. But she doesn't like mm. anyone to see that, particularly her parents. So her room is very much a performance of just being very normal and quiet and plain. And there's not much on the walls. Um, there's a cross, because uh, her family are very religious. Um, and there's a mirror, and it's got a quite like a bit of a sh a coating which is a mixture of like hairspray sprinkles and cat hairs and she's got a patchwork rug which is probably as interesting as it gets in that room <laughs> that's where the colour is um, yeah and that, that's all I've written so far that's really detailed though isn't it <laughs> yeah, how did you get all that detail like, in that short space of time is that what you were saying before of, like you I, when I'm thinking about theatre, I don't think about spaces in this much detail. Mm. This made me feel quite nostalgic of like when I was younger, I used to write like short stories and stories more. So and I'd really like populate the detail and like go for it and dress a space. But I've not had to think in that way in a while because I just don't, mm. I don't think like that when I'm writing theatre, which is interesting. Because we're inhabiting the characters while we're writing, aren't we? Yeah. And so we, we focus on that, on their psychology. Yeah. And I think Rather I have than this sense of like bodies the space, space would be dynamic. Mm. Or again, I leave it open to the design. I'm like, the designer will do whatever they want. Yeah. I have to think about that. So I've just, I just don't bother mm. going there to mm. that kind of detail. And so mine's Amy? Mine's gone the opposite of yours. Mine's gone a bit abstract. And Ooh. So, so I had this character who was a librarian who lived in the caravan. Mm -hmm. So the caravan became this quite small, cramped space within the theatre space that was just full of books. So sort of some of the furniture isn't furniture anymore, it's just books that are maybe used in the way that the furniture would have been. And that maybe even some of the sections of the walls of the caravan are made of books. Now it's sort of taking over, there's not much light in there except maybe like like to read books by. But then I situated that within, I was thinking about the theatre space as a whole and outside of that I was thinking about space and how much space there could be 
this is where it goes really weird and abstract, <laughs> that like the caravan would be in the present and outside of the caravan could represent everything else, so like the past, the future, the universe, mm-hmm. and anywhere else, but there's just a smaller, intense space within that. That's where I got to that. That's really interesting, and that touches on something that I want to do in a little while. Um, because you can play around with space in that way. I think Zodwa mentioned it earlier on when you talked about writing for theatre in the round mm-hmm. and the possibilities that that offered you um, where you could have a character go off um, and their, a contemporary character and come back in as um, a character from a historical yeah. character. So actually we're going to have a look at that in a minute. Um, I wanted us to just, there are two more things to do, but I thought we would think about one of the first things that you spoke about when you talked about the epic, and that was to do with theme or idea. And I just wondered, how do you, when you're writing, um, what what do you start with? Um, Do you you start with um, a theme or... Um, an issue, if you like, and then your characters somehow embody that, or do you start the other way round, as we have today, with character? Um, I have done both, or move back and forth between them. Often, I will start with an idea, with a theme, and just be exploring that, thinking about it quite a lot, doing some research. Um, because we're playwrights, when I'm doing the research, characters and stories come up while you're doing that research. Um, and so the research for us is never something that's dry, is it? It's always something that you're going to dramatize. Or if you're reading theory even, or philosophy, you're going to find a way of dramatizing that through characters um, through events, dramatic events. So, how do you do? You, is that the same yeah, for you? Research. I think I, I do a kind of long periods of research, and I'm like, it's too much. It's too much. <laughs> um, but I definitely kind of enjoy that research phase, and then kind of start building kind of characters. And then I could read something and be like, okay, maybe I can create a character that evokes that point in the research or that idea. So they they become like a, a, a metaphor for that thing. Um, and then because still the other characters start to feed in from that. But I do genuinely love researching. It's like mm-hmm. boxes so, pile up. Yeah. I start with a question, yeah. which is obviously loved by a theme. Um, but I make it like I make it like a provocation to myself, mm-hmm. something that I don't feel like I can necessarily answer. Um, but it helps me whenever I'm researching and going, <laughs> I'm like, wait, hang on, let's go back like to the back, question. Yeah. What is the answer? <laughs> <laughs> like it's an exam, like you answer the question. Um, yeah, so I like to have that. Um, yeah, I'm usually led, like you were saying, led by the story or the idea. Mm-hmm. And then the characters and the environment will present itself um, in a way that makes sense or feels exciting to kind of push the idea. And where does the question come from? Is it something that you think is, is it, is, it, is it a topic that you think has some urgency or relevance for today? Is, is you know, do you have a list of um, ideas that you want to work on? Yeah, yeah. So where, where do they come from? Where does these questions it will be, come it, from? Like you were saying with the person who's political, I love that quote and I feel like I'm very like led by that Um, so it's either one of the two for me I'll be really hooked on something that feels very personal and intimate to me a question that feels so so personal that I know other people will be able to access it because there's that whole personal universal thing Um, or I'll go for something that feels really big and just like, oh, what even is that? That's so intimidating. I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to work so hard to try and get my head around that. But I'll go for one of the two extremes. Um, Both sometimes? Yeah, I feel like you, that yeah. will happen Yeah. Um, naturally. But yeah, that's usually where I come from. Either something that just feels really important to me personally or something that just feels 
massive and like not anything to do with me but I'm like well I'm going to make it about me because why not yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so they're like the two sides of the spectrum that I usually start from anyone else? I had a, I had a commission a couple of years ago that was about a specific person it was about one of the founders of the RSPB and I, and I was like great and then I thought what on earth am I going to write this going to be really is this going to be very dry to some extent we know the outcome she succeeded <laughs> she founded the RSPB <laughs> um, and it was yeah I, I really struggled for a long time and then it was research really and find I found like on the census who was living in the house and I went up to her house and walked around it and it was just finding the story that way and I'd never worked in that way before I'd always kind of started with a character and I know in some ways I was because it was an actual person but it was very much like yeah lots of research and thinking what was it like to be a woman at that time because like 1889 mm -hmm. and uh, she they didn't have a family you know what were the pressures on a woman expectations on a woman at that time and it was sort of finding it through that and details of this household really where she lived with like a husband and then he was only sister lives there and they had two kind of you know, the servants, basically both called Annie, and I was thinking, what what's the dynamic of these two Annies, and they're both called Annie, and it, it's probably very middle class, you know. And it's just yeah, it was a very different way that I than I'd ever worked before. So, really. so the play big, was bigger than you would imagine. In some ways, in but many I only ways, just these two actors. Oh really? Yeah, mm. I knew I was sort of playing told different characters. I thought it would be that, and then when I was given the space, which was an old parsonage. I thought actually I'm going to tell it just through this married couple over a couple of years because the, I sort of used the room, it had like this amazing window looking out into a garden and I, 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 yeah I decided to use that because initially I was, I was like no they'll, she'll go here and she'll speak to them but in the, the story became about them. Mm. Really. Did you make any of it up? If As you were yeah. writing about <laughs> a real person did you did I you got really worried use your imagination. when it was actually on a lady who'd been researching all the women thoroughly who founded the RSPB came to watch it and I remember sitting there thinking, oh, she's going to say, like, <laughs> that's way off. So it was, because there was nothing on this lady, there was very little about this lady, so it did feel like actually I'm, I'm making guesses based on her actions, so we sort of think actually she cares about like this, this particular bird has become extinct, that was the motivation, she was, wasn't allowed to join like the all male ornithology union, so she sort of rebels and formed like just this women's group, so you kind of, kind of making judgments by her actions I guess, mm -hmm. but then the circumstances and the time period, but it did feel a little bit like actually I could be... So you were interpreting yeah, okay. her actions, you were interpreting um, what she'd achieved yeah. and working backwards yeah. to yeah. how she'd got there, yeah. basically. Yeah. And I suppose that in order to do that, you have to somehow um, examine what's going on in your own world, in your own society, to a degree, yeah. don't you? Because yeah. you're, what you're actually doing when you do that is you're making a link between them because otherwise the play wouldn't have, a, you wouldn't write that play yeah. unless yeah. it had some relevance. Yeah to today's audience, yeah. so you're, you're making that link across time, um, and that's a huge um, leap in a way, isn't it? That's, 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 a, that's um, to me, that's part of writing a big historical play. You bring it up to date, but it has this resonance beyond it's the facts yeah. that yeah. you unearth. Yeah. That, that they speak to us or have us ask questions about ourselves, I think. Um, anyone else who didn't comment on this? I think I sort of do it. I think I usually start with a character and just go a little way with it imaginatively. And then I'll stop and look at it and think, well, what is this actually about? What have I tapped into? What is it that I really want to write about? And then maybe I'll research from there so I have a better understanding of something that I've instinctively started to think about and yeah. develop it from there. Mm -hmm. Basically, you just like hear people talking to you and then you go, like, Yeah, how is it? Okay. <laughs> 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 you know, what is it? And then you just let it be for a little while, and if you look at it, there will be something in there mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's like troubling me. Like, oh, okay, that's what, that's what I'm struggling with at the mm -hmm. moment, so that's what this is about. Yeah, I have lots of people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's not all. It's it's not just 
the personal, is it? It's, it's, when we say the personal is political, it's moving from that, um, you know, the, the intimate, the individual, to something bigger and outside ourselves, isn't it? It's, it's the idea that um, we matter, <laughs> you know, each of us as individuals, but that actually if we, it, it's not really about our response, our personal response to a theme or idea, is it really? It's, it's going beyond that, really, but that's a starting point. Yeah. Um, because often we're writing a number of characters anyway who won't feel the way we do. Yeah. And we're not writing, it's not, the writing is usually not autobiographical. And even when it's autobiographical, it's not autobiographical, is it? Mm -hmm. We do something a bit more than that as playwrights. Mm -hmm. Well, not that I'm putting that down, that's really interesting, I think. Um, we've got two more exercises, so we'll start the penultimate writing exercise which is something that we'll all do together in fact it's just a kind of brainstorming exercise so um shall we do that now yeah okay So I asked you to imagine an event that had an impact on the world of your character. So not just the character themselves, but the world around them. Did you all come up with something? Um, shall we hear some of these things? Who'd like to go first, or shall we just go round? Okay, I'll go first. Yeah, OK. <laughs> well, when you, think, when you were talking sort of about like, uh, Brexit and other things that we felt quite important, I was thinking of toxic masculinity, and because mm. there was an article, not an article, but something happened um, last week with a cricket player who, um, mm. him and his friends used to have a WhatsApp group, and they were raping women, and yeah. uh, he raped the girl, and she didn't realise like it was even him until mm. like you know the lights were switched on, and so and he didn't see anything wrong with it. And I was just thinking about how my character loves football, and I was just thinking if a footballer that he loves did something like that. And with him being quite insular anyway, so he's got this little space in bedroom, how how he would, in his mind, sort of rational, uh, rationalize it, but also how he would interact with people he lives with. He would obviously be disgusted, but for him, he's still got like hero worship, if that's like, you know, like, mm. so he can't, he can't sort of punish his hero, he'll try and find a way, even though he doesn't believe in what he's done because he thinks it's a horrific thing, still how he will interact with people, whether it be in his house, at work, his gym, at the park, however, he still hero worships this person and how that will affect him. That's a strong dilemma, isn't it? That's a big dilemma. Um, and one that we're facing a lot at the moment, actually, yeah. because we're hearing a lot about our heroes, our heroines, doing things that yeah. we don't like. Um, and do we discount all the work and the pleasure they've brought us? through their art, through their sport, how do we negotiate that? So that's, yeah, that's a, a big question, I think. Yeah, interesting. Nick, oh, what is this? Less weight in that. Sorry? Mine's less weight in that. <laughs> um, I was sort of thinking of the, because we were thinking about like, climate change, I was thinking of resources and the impacts so on this character in, in the space he's in. So I was thinking if there were things like power cuts and managing food, managing water, so like there's just less access to things and again the impact on the isolation, the impact of when he then interacts with other people like and psychologically what would that do to people if you're kind of potentially in darkness more or uh, yeah how kind of you, you manage those resources in that space. I think again that's really interesting because you've got the world outside that t tiny room which is going through this chaos, which impacts on that little room, in fact. So there you've got a very um, clear relationship between the epic and the intimate. And so there are, again, a lot of possibilities there, aren't there? Um, yeah, I'd, again, you know, both of those, I'd be interested to see where you could go with those stories. Um, Naomi? Um, my event 
think was the Manchester Arena bomb, because we were talking mm. about like that rise of extremism mm. um, and how that would affect people who are visibly Muslim, but also like the communities that surrounds them and how they interact with each other. Mm. So would that be a sort of... Sorry, remind me who your character was in... in um, it was a, ch a young woman. Yes, yeah, a young Muslim mm. woman. Okay. Kind of flirting now with Christianity. Yeah. So there was a reason you, you were a little bit sceptical about having come up with a, a teenager. Yes. But actually this event did affect a lot of very young yeah. people. There were a lot of young people present there. Yes. So would you think, um, I know this is just the beginning, mm -hmm. but would you research the, what had happened on the day or a particular family, do you think, and follow their journey or, or just groups of people? I think possibly I would look into how that event kind of impacts Khadija in terms of what she's allowed to do and not allowed to do by her family, but also who want to like protect her, um, but also what kind of the restrictions that society might put on people who are visibly um, Muslim, like um, dictating like whether they can wear like hijab or burqa or whatever, and manipulating yeah. their clothing and things like that. Yeah. Good. Keisha? Um, I was kind of taken about um, climate change and the discussion we had around that. So that, And I thought of just like a flood because my character is in a basement flat. I just thought, well, that would just immediately impact her um, and change her perspective on like, oh, we need to do something about that. Why have I just had a f I've never had that before. But also... I felt like the tension lived with the fact that she's only concerned now that it's on her doorstep mm -hmm. and she lives in her parents' house and it feels like it, there's a very selfish motivation to her now switching on and being interested in this topic, mm -hmm. which then makes it hard for her to communicate it to other people because people are like, oh, mm -hmm. well, you're just upset because you, you live in your, in your parents' basement and now you need to move out like that apartment's ruined, you're not actually bothered about mm. environmental issues, but she is actually, but because it's come from such as like a mm. personal selfish place, it's really hard to get other people on board. Maybe. That's so interesting, isn't it? Um, and we talked a little bit about Blasted and what Sarah Kane did there, where she looked at the war in Eastern Europe and brought it home, had it, uh, you know, uh, some of the images that we watched on the news, etc were being enacted in a British hotel room, an ordinary hotel room. And so that was, the impact of that was, was really um, fascinating. Same with Debbie Tucker Green stoning Mary. Again, bringing these um, images that we associate with another country, really, mm -hmm. you know, home, what if it happened here? So that, that's, again, there, that's huge. So your stories get, got very big now, hasn't it? <laughs> From that little room, it's become yeah. quite a, a, a big story. Zodwa? Um, I think I kind of put two things together. Um, so the event that takes place is um, a police shooting of a black man, and then how does that then ricochet on the internet? But in relation to my character, I think she is about what did the video online kind of capture? And she saw the moment before what ended up online. So she knows some, a, a truth that everyone else doesn't know, but everyone else is working based on what they've seen online. Wow. Um, and it's about what, did, what happens to that and, and how is it going to serve the wider community? She tells the truth that happened before the video wow. began. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a truth that is an uncomfortable one. Yeah. Can you tell me, uh, remind me the character you started with? Um, she's 16 and she's called Yellow and she lives in Bukhara. That's right, yeah. yeah. So again, you've made a huge leap. Yeah. This again has opened up and become a, an epic, well, yeah. potentially an epic tale, uh, epic play. Yeah, it feels like now it's about kind of the responsibility she has like, to her community because I think the person that they think is the shooter is not the shooter, but it's what the video says is the shooter and she knows the truth. Mm. Um, mine Amy. came out of when we were discussing climate change and resources and Naomi was talking about the right to have children and I started thinking about why would this character have sort of taken themselves off grid and be living in a caravan and I thought 
maybe it's because they're pregnant in a world where they're not allowed to be, mm -hmm. because it's only like certain sanctioned people that are allowed to have babies now. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that's getting a bit sci-fi now. I was like, well, not really. Not like really. China had its one-child policy. And yeah. yeah, yeah. America yeah. trying to control women's uteruses all over the place. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's where I was like going. I about. find that interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, because uh, actually, when you think about it, the, the right, we, we, yeah, we were talking about the right to have children, weren't we? And um, whether that is a, a right, but you've taken the, the idea in a different direction. Yeah. Um, and I, I find that quite fascinating. So again, you've got the global aspect there, because this is something that, in your imagination, will affect all women in this particular world. Um, what, what's interesting about that is that it gives the audience something quite substantial to think about. You know, we were talking about Brett's idea of the epic, where it's the audience who does the thinking. It's about making them think. And I think imagining a future is, is something that will allow them to engage in that particular way. Um, I think actually you've done a lot and you've come you've covered quite a lot of ground in these sh in this short time um and you've come up with some really interesting plays and the beginning of a relationship between the intimate and the epic that you can kind of work on now on your own actually do you think yeah, yeah. um and what i thought we would do with these last um five minutes or so is that you could ask questions if you if you if you have any about anything actually because remember this live stream workshop is not just about the epic the intimate but to encourage people to um write plays to inspire people to write i hope that they also have got something out of this and have moved from the intimate to the epic as we have um but do you have any questions about these exercises or where you might take this? Um, I don't know which is not the exercises, um, but, but the idea around kind of creating something that is epic and how do you, I guess, um, avoid letting the epic nature of it all kind of consume you and kind of stop you from fighting and just kind of beginning? Well, um, I w once, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this in a roundabout way. <laughs> I wrote this play um, and one of the reviewers said, oh, Winston Pinnock has put a lifetime's work in this. There are about 20 plays in this one play. <laughs> you know, she's put, uh, you know, she, he, there could be, she could have written five plays based on this and this was, you know, um, one of the sort of negative criticisms of this play but um, I could see his point and that's the problem I have sometimes mm -hmm. in that the imagination can take over and so for me I don't feel overwhelmed by um, the sort of epic nature of theatre yes. I've done two things in my life Let, let's let's go back um, so I've written plays to order um, for companies like Clean Break where you're only allowed three actors but then even then I wrote more than you know I wrote about 15 <laughs> characters and gave them pre presented them with the challenge of creating that you know just switching you know different directors have have dealt with that in different ways and some just had the actors switching between um, characters but I I just feel um, excited by the possibility of writing um, a big play because I am one of those writers who, you know, you're always being told, oh, you're only allowed tuppence halfpenny, <laughs> and a, sh a shoe box and one and a half acts, you know, one and a half characters or whatever, you know. So the idea that you could um, write, um, you know, a big play is really exciting to me. But it is kind of focus is important, actually, you know. And sometimes, when when your imagination is too wild, actually, what you might be doing is 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 distracting 
yourself from what Keisha mentioned earlier, the question, the big question that you're asking. Um, but I think you know your craft, don't you? So you know when to... It, the, let me start again, again. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing is just to let it all out yeah. initially because it's really hard to write. So you just let rip in the first instance. But because you are developing your craft, you know that you can go back and shape and craft your play so that it is something that um, will engage an audience. But in the first instance, you want to free yourself, don't you, actually, so you don't want to be constrained. What I find is that when you do that, when you really do just allow yourself that freedom, and then you cut, 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 the freedom remains. You focus, but the epic nature of the ideas remain in the play. Um, cutting always, you know, tightening the play um, is always a good thing. Um, and you find that there are ways in which to dramatize something doesn't mean that you have to over explain or put jam pack every idea in there. Actually, focus is is really important. I think you all know what I mean. I hope that people yeah. who are following us know what I mean as well. Um, what purpose does um, stage directions serve mm. for you? For me, all, I always find it really tricky. I'm like, who am I speaking to here? Am I speaking to the actor? Am I speaking to the director? Like, am I just being poetic and writing the story around <laughs> the dialogue? And the I'm always just really kind of like, and I know there's no rule, but I always feel like I just don't really know what I'm doing when I'm when I go to stage directions. So I'm just curious. Um, mm. it's like what? That's a really, really good question, actually. <laughs> um, and I suppose it's something to do with clarity because and it, it's, 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 it's also something to do with the, an awareness that this is a collaboration, isn't it? Mm. That theatre, you know, that there are other artists who are going to have some input into the play. And um, so I, I'm, I'm trying to think about stage directions. Yeah, that goes back to space, doesn't it? And an awareness of, of your characters in that space and how they inhabit that space mm -hmm. and how characters interact with each other. So often um, a stage direction will, will show a character, excuse me, acting or behaving or moving about the space, but that also revealing something of their emotional state. I think. But I don't always explain that. I, I assume that the other artists will be able to interpret, especially actors, will be able to interpret why a character stands and moves across a room instead of saying something, that they might be avoiding something, um, or that they might be having, trying to impact or influence the other character, or control them even. So you imagine, I imagine that they're sophisticated readers of plays and that they understand um, that nothing is there for, everything is there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Every stage direction, every, um, is, is there for some good reason to serve the drama in some way or to reveal something about the characters, yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, you said that you, you've done it both ways, but that you quite often start with theme or idea. Yeah. So when you start like that, how do you take that theme and start to work in the smaller, more intimate details of the story and the characters? Yeah. Um, that's a difficult question to answer in some ways, because often a play isn't, a, you know, the characters aren't going to reveal that they are almost devices <laughs> that I am using to explore these themes. They are real, in, in, to me, um, 
characters who are interacting in real ways often um, and their actions somehow embody the themes of the play. So it's almost as if you sort of, you, you know your theme, but you sort of put it to the side, forget about it a little bit, while characters are born and developing, but you know... A, a little bit like that, that, that what the research has enabled me to do is to understand the character's world mm -hmm. and how they interact with that world because I've thought quite deeply about this. Usually it's a quite, um, you know, uh, yeah, I've, I've thought about this. The, the, I, I've, I've thought about these ideas. I've read a lot. And so, yeah, the characters then um, naturally almost um, embody those themes. For example, um, going back again to a very old play of mine, Leave Taking, I thought quite a lot about the impact of immigration, the personal cost of it to an individual, you know, what they leave behind, um, families, homes, um, food even, things like that. And the idea that that is such a difficult thing to do that you try to forget it. And in this play, the mother doesn't ever talk about back home. Uh, her children want to know. They keep asking her questions because they've never been to the place that she left behind. And that gives rise to a conflict between them because she wants them to live in the present rather than the past. And it, it's quite explosive, actually. But that's an example of me thinking and reading about um, immigration, even though it is part of my own life, it's, it's, it's part of my lived experience, but I still had to think very deeply about it and what it meant, because as a playwright, you don't just write down your own thoughts and experiences and emotions, you think very deeply and you um, interrogate that uh, theme, if you like, through your characters, actions, through dramatic action, yeah. Anything else? I think that um, we're done. Well done. I'm, I'm really <laughs> pleased with you. what you um, ended up with. And um, I just need to say that this workshop will be available on writeplay.co.uk website in a short while. And the next workshop will be on Friday the 26th of April. That's the second international workshop. And that will be hosted by Barclay Rep with playwright Naomi Lizuka. So thank you so much for working along with us. I hope that you've come up with um, the beginnings of plays as interesting as this group of writers. And we'll see you again next time. Thank you.